Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Education Impact Day for 2016. Today is November 12th, and we are really excited to have one of our board of director members, um, uh, Dr. Monica Tracy, with us today. And we normally just talk about board things related to designers for learning. So this is an opportunity for us to talk to Monica about her practice and her research of instructional design um, and working with students and her past history. And then most importantly, the question of the day for everybody is what impact will you make? And so we've asked her to think about that in the context of her work is also in, in the context of how she mentors her students. Um, so with that short introduction, Monica, you want to just give us, I think it'd be really great if you would give us a quick introduction of yourself, starting with your, um, your work as a practitioner, because I think that's a kind of a cool aspect of your history that people would be interested in hearing about. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, in order to start, what I'd like to say is this next 30 minutes is going to be all about you. Okay, um, we're talking about making an impact and how we can make an impact on others. And in order to do that, what I'm really going to focus on this afternoon is making an impact with yourself first. If you look at yourself, take care of yourself, know yourself inside and out, then you have, you're filled up and you're able to make an impact on others. So with that, I'll be happy to talk a little bit about my long and winding road to get to where I am right now. Um, I started out just, you know, like all of us, I'm sure, working to make money as a high school kid and working my way through college, etc. And I was in a class at Central Michigan University in Michigan, and I was with a very young um, female professor. And I will never forget how she looked and how she moved that room. And I was always a curious kid. I always wanted to know. I can remember as a child standing on a chair in the living room because I was going to fly. I was sure I was going to fly. I kept jumping off the chair and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't fly. <laughs> and um, I was always a curious kid. But watching this professor and watching her move the room to make them excited about learning, I remember as a 19-year-old saying, I'm going to do that someday. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I didn't do that right away. I graduated from college and I then got a master's degree in education. And I worked in corporate um, training. I became a, in the 1980s, it was called a behavior modification specialist, um, and where I designed behavior modification instruction for adults. And then I slowly worked through um, with a number of different corporations, ending with having my own company, having a C corporation in 1995, I began a C corporation, where we designed um, and developed and implemented solutions to improve performance for adult learners. So all of those years of professional experience and practice really helped me um, in 2001 when I walked into the academic door. So I always say that I'm an academic, but I'm a practitioner first. Um, and then and then I could bring all those skills into academia. That's exactly what I wanted you to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> and she did not read from a script. She... No, no, no. It, you know, it's one thing, and this is, this is why I'm going to do a little quick plug for designers for learning here. This is why this is so important. It is one thing to learn about design from a book or from a class or from a professor. It is another thing to do, to perform, to actually design. And you cannot know how to do it until you do it. And you cannot know how to do it correctly ever. I'm still learning every single design project I do. I, I have to, I take past failures and I learn something new and it, it helps me become a better designer for the next design project I do. So that's my plug for designers for learning. Thank you. And I didn't pay her for that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Monica, you said when, when you when you started, you really did want this to be about people contemplating um, their impact. And, and so maybe maybe that is a, a place to start. Certainly, I think one of my things that I can never believe about how you spend your day, and I think we spoke yesterday afternoon, and you were about to, to hop on several different small group conversations with your students, and you really do kind of that practice, what you preach with it, you're saying that teacher who motivated her students, um, like, what is your approach to um, having people contemplate their, what, what their, what their gifts are, and what, what they have to offer, and, and what impact they can make? 
Well, it starts with this. You have to start with you. So what I'd like you all to do is just think about yourselves. I know we're not supposed to be doing that, right? We're not supposed to be self-focused. But just think about yourself for a minute. What is your passion? What do you love? I remember when I was picking my dissertation topic, and I told my advisor at the time that I loved Howard Gardner's bent on multiple intelligences for, my, for his, his student, for children, right? And I said, I want to take that. This was back in, in the night, it was 1999. I said, I want to take that, and I want to incorporate multiple intelligences in designing for adults, for the end learner, and adults because I believe we need to look at them as individuals and differently and that was she didn't really want me to do that and she kind of pushed back on it but it was my passion and so I did it and that made my dissertation a gift of love not a painful gift it wasn't painful it wasn't painful work it was it was it was love okay so think about what makes you tick what do you love to do? That should be your research agenda. That should be where you work. That should be um, how you make your money. And, you, and, and if you can't decide now, start making lists. Start journaling. This is what I love. And it may be something as simple as I love going for a walk. I love going for a run. Um, I have a daughter who loves exercising. She loves it. She's also in advertising, but she loves to exercise. And she has started doing these um, exercises. She just did one last Saturday where it was a um, that soul cycle that everyone's doing now. She did a soul cycle fundraiser for a particular disease because exercise is her passion and she also wants to improve the society. Who would have ever thought? Those are the kinds of things you can do if you find your passion. The other thing I think I make sure that I, I do with my students is I want them to key into their emotions and I ask a lot of questions about that, which is why I meet them with them on a weekly basis. I have small group meetings with my students every single week. My class is online, it's a design class. I want them to know I'm engaged with them. I want them to be engaged with me. I want them to be engaged with themselves. I want them to think about empathy. How do you have someone think about empathy? By showing empathy. So I look at my students and I see where they are and I put myself in their shoes as best I can. I'm not gonna be naive to think I can permanently, but I try to and I think I'll give you a story. This is the best way I could describe it. I have, I have students who are from other countries, particularly the Middle East, um, gentlemen for, for the most part, who are getting their PhDs. In the Middle Eastern culture, it's very difficult for a man to turn around and ask a woman for help, right? Every time I have a student who attempts to do that, that must be so challenging for them, so difficult for them. So I make sure to make it as easy as possible. It's a small thing, but what's my impact? Showing that student, I see you, I understand a little bit about your challenges, and I want you to go ahead and do the same when you move forward and become a professor. Am I answering your question, Jennifer? Absolutely, and you know, this I think is a really good place to then um, bridge off to some of the, the your, your, your research and then the, some of the practices you formalized, I guess, practices you include in your classroom as far as designer identity and re the reflections that mm -hmm. you um, incorporate as part of your class. Um, so would you mind kind of going down sure. that path a little bit, either talking about how you use it in your classroom or then also some of the findings and, and the research that you're doing in that area? I'm happy to. The one thing I want to do, though, is I want to stop. Um, anytime you all have a question or a comment or you want me to clarify something, Stop me. So um, I, I, don't, I think Janet, you're the one who's kind of monitoring the chat. Stop me and I'll be happy to clarify whatever, whatever you need me to, to clarify. But empathy, okay, let's go back to empathy for a minute, is a crucial skill for connecting with the end users. So we can sit here and we can follow our little design models. And we can make sure that we check the balance, you know, check off all the things we do, all the little steps. But if we don't see and feel our end learners, we've completely missed the mark. And how can we see and feel our end learners? We have to be able to know and see and feel ourselves. 
We have to be able to incorporate, and this is very different. You have to remember years ago, not even that long ago, we looked at design, our field looked at design as a step-by-step -step process, right? They never talked about the designer. They never talked about the designer as the arbiter of the actual design, the actual experience. So when we take a look at designers, the designer's personal beliefs, your experiences, your self-awareness, how aware you are, all that goes into the design space. All of that feeds the output, which is those innovative solutions. So we can just design something, anybody, not anybody, but we can design instruction, you know, crank it out, crank it out, crank it out. Is it innovative? Is it going to, to meet the real needs of our end users? That's where we need our emotion our empathy, our self-awareness. That's why when I say it's all about me, make it all about you in order for you to then make it all about them. Yeah, you know what, um, and keep it, keep hold that thought because you, uh, you've you on, touched on so many things, so many of our prior, and just for those that are listening, I want to connect some dots. Even back when we were talking to Patty Constantakis was talk, us, talking earlier about um, she's trying to bring together what she calls them designers, but she's what she would be more talking about what we would, you and I would probably refer to as a developer. So someone who's got the tech skills to be able to um, implement what we're trying to do. And so we were talking about that in our conversation with her is that they have this perception that they, um, this isn't a, a field that they can jump into because they aren't, that, that's not their expertise. And you and I've had lots and lots of conversations about, um, you know, what you bring to the table is what you bring to the table. And so um, I think that ties in with a lot of the com conversations we've had as far as the, you know, empathy from the designer standpoint, as well as like um, the, from the perspective of understanding your learners and their needs. But yeah, sorry, jump back in. That's okay. <laughs> so, so I'm going to give you another example because this is the best way, this is the way I usually teach. So, and I'm not really teaching today, but this is, this is my other example. One of my, my most exciting, and I, I published about it, my, and Jennifer, you and I talked about this at length, is I did a year-long um, instructional design project in the Middle East, um, in the United Arab Emirates, in Dubai. And what I had to do was I had, to, I had a team, a design team, and we designed instruction for 400 unskilled laborers from many different countries, okay? So these are individuals who were literally taken off of these very, very rural places in Nepal, in India, in Bangladesh, and they were brought into Dubai to work. They, they surrender their passports when they get there, and they work there for two years. And one of their jobs was to clean the largest mall in the world. Now, you can imagine for a second, put yourself in their shoes. They've nev never seen a mall They've never seen many of the, the things that are in the mall they have to clean, including these indoor washroom facilities. They don't know what a water fountain is because they, they, were, they were living in these very rural areas. They don't know the language. They don't know the people that are now supervising them. And those people often spoke a different language. And they don't have family. They have no support system. And they're there for two years. You can imagine the empathy that my team had to have from beginning to end on that project. And how did we get that empathy? How did we connect with them emotionally? We went to the labor camps that they were living in. We went to the airport and watched them deplane without shoes on. We sat with them while they were eating. We couldn't speak. We didn't speak. We just sat with them. We looked at their lives when we, we found a couple that spoke English or a couple that could translate for us. We asked them about their families. We asked them, all of the individuals, it was really interesting, and we used this in our design. They all had smartphones. Okay, believe it or not, they all had smartphones, and they would show us pictures of their families, pictures of their villages, pictures of their communities. Pictures of their parents that sending their money home to. All of that impacted our solution. Now, it would have been one thing, we were on a, on a short time frame, it would have been one thing to go in and just crank it out, crank out this design, which is what our stakeholder wanted us to do. But we knew that we would have missed the mark if we would have done it that way. 
So we ended up going in and, and we lived in Dubai. Part of my team, most of my team lived in Dubai um, and, and lived with these folks. And then we could design for them. So Monica, would you say, like you were kind of doing a compare and contrast to kind of a traditional, and I'm putting in air quotes that you can't see, um, design approach, there probably would have been a task analysis, yes. right? Like what did, they, and very procedural, yes. what did you need to do? And it would have been some type of almost like content man manual that you somehow would have handed them and then maybe yes. tested them, probably not even on recall. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering if we could use that as an example of what like a traditional instruction probably would have looked like. What, what did your end product look like then? Okay, I'll be happy to I'll be happy to, to tell you that is exactly what traditionally would have happened. What we did was we created almost like job aids, they were laminated job aids with visuals for every single step. And we handed them those visuals, but we modeled. So I was in there cleaning toilets. We modeled step by step what they had to do. Then we had them model it while I was standing right with them, correcting any behavior. And then we removed, I stood back or the facilitator stood back and they did it a third time. And there were smiles and praises and clapping for every single step they did correctly. And I will tell you something we learned about these end users. They wanted to do the job well because they wanted to make the money to send home to their families and their villages. Mm -hmm. They were the most motivated group of individuals I've ever had the pleasure of designing for and working with. So we ended up doing a procedural analysis, not of the learners, but procedural analysis of how to clean a washroom as an example. And then we made all of it pictures. All of it, and we had to use particular colors. In certain cultures, there are colors that are, are, are not welcomed. Um, we had to have certain images. We had to know all of that. But the biggest key to this was we connected with them physically, not Verbally, like Jan Lee's model, she she labeled that uh, for that. Um, but I, I think also just at a very basic instructional. We talked a lot a little bit earlier also about this whole idea of content test, content test, content test uh, model of instruction. And I think if nothing else, you know, setting aside even the um, empathic design aspect of yes. it, hitting them to so you can watch the outcome, watch the actions happening and make, you know, corrective guidance as it's going on, all those types of things um, are so important. And there were little things like one of the, the stakeholder, and the stakeholder was Emar Property, the owner of the Dubai Mall, um, a very, very wealthy developer. And that stakeholder, I mean, in, in a way, it was really wonderful. What his, one of his goals was, was to have these individuals learn English. Um, he wanted to have the common language by the end of their two years. So he was trying to help them learn English by hiring us. So what we did was we had the step-by-steps in the graphic form, and then we had it in, um, uh, in the foreign language. What we used was we used Hindi, um, and that was the most common language. And then below that, we had it in English. And then what we did was we papered the buses inside the buses that drove them one hour in from the labor camp into the mall, and drove them home one hour at night. We wallpapered them with all of these steps. So they were sitting on the buses and they, were, they would look at them. So I thought, well, are they really going to do this? Well, I will tell you that they would not only do it, but they would come in and through interpreters or through showing us visually, they were telling us that they were doing it and they were proud of it. They were proud and they wanted us to reinforce, you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. That's great that you're doing it. So all of these ways we could help them feel better about themselves, their job, their learning, that only made our design that much more innovative, that much better. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's see if I can try to um, steer this question so okay. uh, it'll be meaningful. <laughs> um, I think one of the neat aspects of your progression through instructional design, you, you had a, I would consider a fairly traditional um, instructional design program. And it wasn't, what was it called? What When you had your PhD, went to your PhD? My PhD program was called Instructional Technology. We are now called Learning Design and Technology. It was a very traditional program. I, um, I took my first 
course in 1994 in my doctorate, and I learned task analysis, content analysis, learner analysis, et cetera, procedural task analysis, et cetera. So yes, it was very traditional. And, and I know some of the classes you teach, and I know you teach a theory class, right? Yes. So I, we start, I, I just want to make sure we, we're not putting you out there that you've, you've rejected oh, no, no, no. <laughs> decades and decades this of theory. Is, this is, so maybe if you could help us connect the dots on, yeah. you know, how do you blend in your head and in your practice what, we, what we've done and what we do now and what you know and all that? Well, I think that the most important thing is what you just said. You don't reject. What is my designer precedence? What is my designer identity? Think about what your designer identity. My designer precedence includes the Dick and Carey model. It includes procedural analysis and task analysis and content analysis. It includes all of those things. Those are part of what I know, my, my knowledge base, right? What are my experiences? Those are all of the practical experiences, the years. I started designing in 1986 before I knew that it was designing because I was a teacher. Okay, so all of that is also part of my designer precedence. So when I think about designers, the, the other key piece was, is my self-awareness. It's, it's learning what, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What do I need to do? Here's an ex another example. For me now, at this point, 2016, I need to be part of a design team. I could design by myself. That is not how I, I do the best work. I do the best work collaboratively. So why is that that way for me? I have no idea. But I do know that it could be in part because I was raised in a family of eight people. We did everything together. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I never had my own bedroom. Everything we did was we did it together as a team, my, my, my five siblings and myself. Did that prepare me for working collaboratively? I don't know, could have, mm -hmm. but I know enough about myself to know my best work is when I work with the team. Mm -hmm. That's so I haven't rejected anything. I've just added, added, added in, into my pot of precedence. Yeah. And I think we run into that um, occasionally within the MOOC. We have a, a, a lot of students who are either just finishing or have, have just finished their um, their schoolwork. And so obviously that's going to be a lot of theory without a lot of practical application. Okay. And I think turning that corner and trusting yourself um, to do exactly what you said, because it, it's at first it appears our approach we take as much as you described. We have a, um, a personas that we use as um, mm -hmm. our approach to empathy. And um, people are looking for where does this fall in the Morrison Ross Kemp model? You know, they're looking to try to relay things back to the theory and the models that they learned. And it's there. It's there, but it's not maybe as explicitly laid out as you probably were led to believe right. <laughs> in your graduate classes that there's, you, you're going to start out from point A and go you know, to point Z. It's there. So think about this. So think about it this way, okay? Let's go back to the Dubai example. How did I come up with the, with the pictures, mm -hmm. being an entire visual? I'll tell you. It, this had nothing to do with anything I ever read. We were on the flight home. We flew there as a team in August. Landed, it was 120 degrees in Dubai. It was beautiful. Dust everywhere because they were under major construction. We flew there in August for seven days to do an initial, okay, is, this is what it, it is. This is what we're doing. And then we had to pitch our proposal to them. So the wheels started turning when I was there. On the flight back, I was reading a magazine and the Beijing Olympics were going on. Okay, the Beijing Olympics. And in the magazine, it showed this, it was like a ring, and on it were all of these different um, places, different uh, places that people could go or different things they would need, like taxi, and it was a picture. And they showed this, they were giving this to individuals who were going over for the Beijing Olympics and didn't speak a language. And I was looking at that and I thought, oh my gosh, that is what we could do. Now, did my idea go very, very far? I mean, it, different from that? It was different to some degree, but that was a component of it. Did that come out of a book or a theory? It came out of my gut. It came out of reading something. Do we need the theories of the books? Without a doubt, because what I did was when we had that idea, then I went back and I looked at message design. Message design. How yeah. should it be? What should it look like?
like? What should it have? How large it should be? I knew to make that connection with my intuition with the existing theory. That's when you make a good design. So what I have to say to, to the individuals watching, I don't know how much more time I have, but this is what I would recommend for you to do. Whenever you're designing anything, you're redoing your bedroom. You're designing uh, uh, how you're going to lay out your kitchen in terms of what's going to be in what cabinet. Jot down where you think those ideas came from. Jot them down. They came from somewhere. Did it come from a book? Did it come from your past? Did it come from a friend's suggestion? Did it come from your gut? Start to think about what we find, what I find in my research, and my, my research agenda is on designer identity and developing designer identity. What I'm finding in my research is designers have a really difficult time being able to articulate where their designs came from. And that's an important thing to know because not that you have to necessarily explain it, but it helps you know your own designer identity. When I say I think some of my designs came from my childhood, from being raised in the environment I was raised in, I can list things that happened to me and, and that I was a part of that helped make me who I am as a designer today and as an educator today. So I would, I would you know, get a, get a three ring binder, get a notebook, get something fun. You do it on, on electronically if you want. Start jotting down. Document where your design ideas come from. Then what you can do is take a look and that will help you make meaning of your decisions, the decisions you made. You, the, the, a way to be, develop your designer identity is to begin to understand why you're doing what you're doing in terms of design. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is a perfect segue to a question and then um, kind of putting a little exclamation point on something you mentioned before that we have, we don't abandon what we know. Um, but we're, the question in the chat room, uh, Let's answer that, and then I'll kind of tie in what, what I was thinking as far as uh, the formative evaluation question. Um, the question from BJ is, uh, was there a formative review of the instruction and the improvements made based upon the end user feedback? And I think this goes back to your, I know it goes back to your Dubai. Dubai. My Dubai? Okay, I'll tell you. Um, BJ, what a great question. The, you got to imagine this, okay? I want to paint the scene. We're in the Dubai Mall. It is still under construction. We were told in August all of these wonderful things were going to be done. We arrived October 1st, none of them were done. The mall actually had to open a week later because they couldn't get the construction done. We came up with our initial design. We took a, a small group of workers, of end learners, into one of the washrooms. We had fire alarms being tested. We had drills going. I mean, it was wild. And we actually went through the procedures with them and I had two designers documenting what was going wrong, what was going right. The individuals, we had one interpreter asking the, the workers, the end users, and what was working, what they understood, what they didn't understand. We were literally making changes in the washroom on a laptop. <laughs> and then we emailed those that document to the United States. We had graphic designers making all of the visual changes. The files were then too large. This was in 2008. So we ended up, they ended up taking them to a Kinko's in the United States, who then uploaded them to the Kinko's in Dubai, who then printed them, who then brought them to us. And all this was going on in 24 hour cycle. You can imagine what this was like. We had two very distinct design teams with a lot of jobs, and we had a nine hour difference time wise um, in terms of we would have design meetings, and for us it was the end of the day, and for them they were just waking up. Um, so you can imagine what this process was like. But to answer your question, yes, we did. And it's really an interesting formative evaluation. And then I'll put my little um, dot, 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 not related to, uh, to uh, Monica's Dubai project, but just what I do every day. Um, I'll have an idea, much like Monica said, and I'll jot down my ideas on it. It is, I, for me, lined paper with a red, pa red I don't know why, I just, if I have that in my hand, I can get the creative juices flowing. Mm -hmm. But rarely then don't I go back to one of my textbooks or maybe a prior project um, to try to find, like message design is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, or if I'm coming, trying to come up with question prompts, mm -hmm. there's huge bodies of research, research on how to ask questions. And um, I will go back to old school <laughs> research and theory on that. Yes. And I, you know, I just, I just think it's so important that, you know, there is this idea that we just have to 
even to the point of abandoning our name, not calling ourselves instructional designers anymore. We have to call ourselves learner experience designers, which is fine. I mean, that, that name doesn't offend me as so much as some other ones. But I do think there's this idea we have to throw out the old in order no. to... I think you have to embrace it. You have to, you have to know it. Because if you don't know it, you can't move forward. So, so I want to, I know that we're going to be wrapping up soon, but I want to just say to all of you, for me, my impact, the impact I want to make is I want my designers to find their passion, my students to find their passion, and then to go out and use that passion to, to branch out, to teach in a passionate, knowledgeable way design passionate, knowledgeable solutions to teach so that they, they can impassion their end learners and then they can go out and go out and go out. That is, if we do that, if we make a difference in one person, and I know we say it all the time, but really make that difference in one person, starting with us, mm -hmm. make it then with one person after outside of us, we're making an impact. Well, there have been many, many comments in the text chat that your enthusiasm and passion is showing. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, it's there. It's, it's, okay. it's, totally, it's, it's totally there. I, I don't know. Do we have any time for anything yeah. else? Do we have any time for any yeah. other stories? Absolutely. Well, we're, we're at 28 minutes, so we you can take as much. We really don't have anybody starting until the top of the hour. So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of... Well, I would love to have some questions. I mean, yeah. does anyone have any questions? Anything that you want... Um, you know what so what are you going to do i this is what I, I want you to do i want you to go get that notebook i want you to think about what you've designed what was the last thing you designed and it may not be an instructional design what was the last thing you designed okay think about what it looked like think about how you got there write down what what you love about it what you didn't love about it and then start looking at where those all those decisions all those ideas came from that's where you're starting to describe your professional identity. Think about um, things that move you and try to entwine those somehow into your life on a daily basis. Um, and then use that as fuel to, to push you forward to be that much better. And I would say practice. You'll make mistakes. You need to make mistakes. Mistakes are great. Let me tell you, I had, my, I had a design Three, uh, three years, I'm on an NIH grant. I'm a co-PI of an NIH grant. Our first year of our design, it was a mess. The good news was we were, we were teaching physicists, biologists, and radiation oncologists, and those folks don't know good design if it would slap them in the face. So our, our evaluations were great, but we knew, our design team knew, it was not good. It was a failure. And we took that and we spent the next year making it better, changing it, learning from that failure. So go out and design and fail at it. And, and I mean, hopefully you won't impact too many people in your failures, but fail at it and then use that failure to make it better to learn from it, to improve your design ability. And I, I will attest, I believe, wasn't that that first session followed by at least three days of Netflix in your PJs? Yes. Couch, so. Yes, I, I, was, I was in flannel pajamas watching very old Sex in the City episodes for three solid days. Yeah, um, so because I felt so like such a failure. And this was uh, three, four years ago. Three, four years ago. This was four years ago. I had been practicing design since 1986. This was four years ago. Yeah, and you know, I think um, and tying all this back to what we see in our in our MOOC, it's really hard for people to share their work because that's a big part of what we do is we have showcases for most deliverables. And it's, it, I think a lot of people are hesitant to even turn the assignment in because of the people reviewing. You know, it's a scary thing to have people. What you have to do is, you, that's such a good point, Jennifer, you have to be vulnerable. And that's in your self-awareness. That is where you know that you are developing your identity as a person. You have to be vulnerable. You also have to be vulnerable in the safety of, of with people who you are safe with. That is one of the things that I do with my students. I encourage them to fail with me. It's safe with me. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're, what you're worried about. Tell me what you don't know. And I always say to my students, I, I teach the, the introduction to design course. It's, it's called Design Thinking and Knowledge. And I say to them, how would you know this? You're not supposed to know this. 
you never designed before. And even if you designed before, you didn't articulate it like we're articulating it now. You shouldn't know this. If you knew this, I'd feel bad. My job wouldn't be needed anymore. You wouldn't need me. Mm -hmm. You have to fail, but feel, but be vulnerable and feel safe with who you are failing with. And therefore, for those of you who are teaching others, make that environment safe for those folks to fail with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have an excellent question from Jason, and I'm going to add a part B to it because it's a really good one. It, it, yeah. Okay, so how do we um, help people make careers out of passion? That's that's part A. And part B, you mentioned your stakeholders in a couple different examples had an idea of what they wanted you to do. <laughs> so how do you, if you get a job that you think you're going to be able to do your passions, but then reality sets in and someone comes at you with their list of requirements and it sucks all the yeah. <laughs> innovation and whatever out of your design. So maybe if you could, you know, Take that as a question however you, want to, however you want to take it. Okay, so first of all, how to make careers out of passion. I think you have to think, truly think, and write out and, and tweak what your passions are. Okay, I mean, one of my passions is watching movies. You know, I probably should have been one of those movie critics. But I never really made that happen. So... Watching movies, okay, that's a nice passion. Is it going to get me a job? Probably not, okay? But there's other passions that I have. So you can't necessarily have it just be one of your passions. You've got to make a list of all of your passions and realize that some are going to be realistic and some aren't. Now, I will tell you this. Watching movies is one of my passions. So if you know what I do in my spare time, I watch TED Talks. Every time I watch a TED Talk, I learn something. And I incorporate some of that in with my with my designing and, and of course with my teaching. So that's one way that I use my passion of watching movies in my career. Okay. So how do you make that? You have to list all of your passions and figure out what is out there. And the only way to figure out what is out there is to learn. Be curious. Read as much as you can read. If we stay focused in what we know, you don't know what's out there that you don't know, okay? Um, read everything. I, you know, I, I, I chuckle. My husband dies with me because I have newspapers. I've got magazines. I read everything I can read. The Dubai example was a perfect example. I think it was in a Vanity Fair that I was reading on the plane flying home. Um, read as much as you can. Don't just be on you know, Facebook or whatever. I mean, you can learn things there too. Go to not just opinion sites, go to the sites where you can actually read and learn about things because you'll be amazed at what can possibly, a light bulb, what light bulb can possibly go on. If you have stakeholders, and there, this is a loaded question, we don't have a ton of time here, but I will say this about my stakeholders. Knowing myself has helped me know my stakeholders because I go in without combative attitude. I go in with the teaching attitude. I have to teach them and I will teach them as best as I can beginning with determining right away to meet them where they are. Not where I think they should be, not where I am, not where my past stakeholder was, but where they are. That is humbling. Because when you look at someone and you meet them exactly where they are, all of your great ideas don't really matter much. Mm -hmm. And you must start there. If you don't start there, forget it. So I would sit with the, I never never sat with Muhammad Alibar, the Emar owner, because that was way above my pay grade. But I would sit with his, his people, okay? And I would listen. And I would listen to what they said about education. Can you imagine what they thought versus what we were doing? And every once in a while, I would try to, I would wait and wait and wait and wait. There were a lot of very quiet lunches, believe it or not. You're seeing how much I can talk. I would say nothing. And I would take notes, mental notes. And then I would figure out how I could go ahead and teach them, based on where they were, something about design. I'll never forget, we had a meeting in November. We had been there since October 1st. We had a meeting six weeks into the project with Muhammad Alibar's direct right arm. And I had to teach him about the systems approach of cleaning this, this washroom. Mm -hmm. 
And what I did was I did it in PowerPoint slides with little people where I would click the slide and the people would move, click it again, the people would move, click it again, the people would move. And I gave him a map because he was very visual, I could tell. I gave him a map of the washroom, and while we were walking through it, he had his finger and he was tracing the map that was placed in front of him, the paper mm -hmm. map. Mm -hmm. I met him where he was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you, didn't, you, you didn't confront him and, no. <laughs> and say, we're not doing it that way. It was uh, I would have been on a plane <laughs> back to the United States. That's the problem. And talk about failures. My first failure is trying to be a freelancer. I told them that their idea was not... Uh, they should. It wasn't an instructional intervention, and they were. I was escorted. escorted to that. Don't, you tell them that you're uh, you're not your solution's not right. They probably won't keep you there. Well, and, and you also you have to build that relationship, and and the way to really build the relationship, I believe, is being honest. I had a client in Detroit when I when I lived in Detroit, and they wanted me to design an entire two day leadership training. Okay, and I went in and I met with them and we talked about what the problem was and we talked about, you know, what they wanted and blah, blah, blah. And they, this was going to be about a $75,000 project for me. And I stopped them and I said, you know what, this is not what you need. You need to assess where your leaders are right now in terms of team and leadership. So let's do an assessment. Let's do a, a $5,000 assessment and then we'll determine what we need afterwards. And what, we, what they ended up needing was nowhere near two days. It was very different. But they were so appreciative that I said, instead of saying, I'll take the money and, and do it, even though I knew it wouldn't have been correct, I said, no, 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 let's do this first and let's see. And then the project ended up being much less money for me, but I continued to get tons and tons of work from my stakeholders. They trusted me. Right. We have so many questions. Well, Monica, if you okay, have a life to lead and you have to... No, leave, no, no, I'm fine. Go ahead. We'll Our just... Uh, if Jason, Jason's probably enjoying a little bit of a break right now because he's got a... Um, he's on next with um, okay. Mr. I believe. So if you don't mind, just kind of... No feel doubt. What <laughs> questions would you like me to do? Are there questions you want me to answer? Yeah, if you kind of go through that, you can see the text chat, right? I'm just kind of scrolling back through. We've had some really great dialogue. It looks like you've inspired Jennifer. She was going to ditch her dissertation, it looks like, or her, her master's thesis um, because she was getting pushed back, but it looks like you've um, encouraged her to keep... Keep, keep with it. it, because if you don't, it will become... It, it won't be yours. Keep with your passion. Stay firm with that. Be kind, because you have to get a grade from these folks. <laughs> But stay firm with it, okay? Well, I think, Monica, what you just said about your stakeholder, you didn't, um, you appreciate, you had to meet him where he was. And so yes. I think that's going to be part of her cell. I had to do that. I love my dissertation advisor, Dr. Morrison, uh, more than, you know, anybody, any teacher I've ever had. But he didn't, did not want me to study, uh, or if I would have come to him and say, I want to do a study on social presence in a community of inquiry, he would have shown me the door. That's not his background, what he's interested in. So I completely had to um, craft a dissertation that met I mean, he also has to be interested in reading it and working on it. He's right. in a, going to be a big, <laughs> so maybe that would be my piece of advice to you as well is, you know, think of ways that you can um, loop in the people who will be giving you feedback as part of your um, advisory committee. Right, right. And once again, meet them where you are. But the, in order to meet them where you are and get to where you want to go, you have to know yourself. You cannot mold. I mean, and I see students who do that. They look at me and they say, well, Dr. Tracy, I just don't know what you want. And I'm like, it is not about me. It is about you. So meet them where they are, but know yourself and stay firm with yourself. And that's why you need to develop your identity as a student and as a professional. You have to know who you are. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Okay. I was thinking of the picture options. I'm sorry. I'm sure I'll be reading this. Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I do have Dr. Tracy's email at WSU, and she is the is why I am attending online today. Well, thank you, George. You have a fan club. You have a fan base. That's true. I don't know who George is, but thank you. I'm so glad. Um, <laughs> and then up at the top, there's a question from BJ up a, a little bit, too, about uh, your corporate L&D background. What are your thoughts about necessary competencies for performing successfully in L&D roles uh, for in the corporate sector? I'm sorry, I can't see it. Oh, here we are, here we are. Okay, what are my thoughts about necessary competencies for performing successfully? Um, I think that it depends on the company. I think that it depends on what the competencies are and what, how the competencies are used. 
Um, here's an example that I can give you with another client that I had in, in Detroit. Um, it was an insurance company and they were closing all of their regional offices. They actually had one in Toronto as well, Canada, and they were closing all five of them. There were four in the US, one in Toronto, and they were pooling all five of these call centers to one, okay, um, in Chicago. They were moving everything, consolidating it to one. They had to come up with competencies for all, all of the different levels um, of the jobs necessary, the leadership levels, the call center folks, everything in this new call center. Because they are all of these other call centers that they were going to be taking some of those employees and feeding them in. Those competencies were really important because it was used as the baseline for who to bring, who to keep in the company, and who to bring into the Chicago new call center um, that was going to be a whole new processes, etc. So in that sense, that was an important way to, to develop the competencies. It was an important way to use them. It was an important thing to develop them and it was an important thing to use them. What it also did was it helped us determine what this call center was going to look like. So it forced us to really think about all of the different positions, etc. That was one way um, to, to use the competencies correctly in business. So this is in the context that individuals in the business sector in the areas of is it, uh, may not have educational backgrounds and experience in the area, therefore they may have impact on effective instructional design. Got it. So you're looking at learning design. Uh, so you're, are you looking at, tell me, um, BJ, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're looking at companies that maybe have a, a learning and design department where they have individuals who've worked for the company come into the department, but they're not necessarily trained in instructional design. Is, am I correct on that, Jennifer? Is that what the yeah, he's looking at. Okay. That's a tough one. And there, this is why it's a tough one. It isn't enough to just know the content of your company, the content of the jobs in your company. That's a subject matter expert. Knowing design and how to design those innovative solutions, you need to have instructional design, education, and experience. So what I would suggest for a company who has this structure, and there are many, many that do, is I would suggest many severe, concentrated professional development situations. Because you're not going to get rid of those folks, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to have to teach them. You're going to have to educate them. And there's all sorts of ways of educating them. This is, this is one way right here. Through webinars, um, through two-hour professional developments where you teach them basic skills, and then you continue to do it. Um, till they get to the point, through practice, through having them work with someone in a team who has a degree in instructional technology or instructional design, um, who has that educational base, who can teach them while they're actually doing it. That is what I would recommend. Um, I, and I was that with a lot of companies, especially the auto industries in Detroit when I had my C corporation, they would have design teams because they would have design departments in at General Motors was one and then they would hire me to come in and work with those design teams and I was teaching them design as, as we were working Does and we have yeah and that comes up so often we have um, a lot of people who join the MOOC who call themselves um, accidental instructional designers mm -hmm. they're in that L&D role um, and probably to your point or maybe subject matter matter experts within the company they're at that happened to me when I was in an, an insurance yeah. underwriter uh, suddenly yeah. they put me in a role where I needed to do the training sessions for our new underwriters. And I knew at that point, not, I mean, I hope I know more now. But. Right. But you knew nothing. And that's why having someone, I don't think that you can change that model in companies. And I don't think we necessarily should, but I think we need to once again, supplement that model, bringing in like with, with general motors, they had an entire learning um, design division. I don't even know if they still have it, but this was in the nineties and they would bring me in. I would do day long instructional workshops with them. I would work on teams with them, helping them, teaching them quietly because you had to respect what they called themselves and the role that they were given. So I would teach them through modeling, teach them, teach them, teach them, scaffold, scaffold, and then, and then they got to a point where they were starting to really see the success. Job aids helped. Things like this. I, I keep this on my desk. This is a job aid that, that it um, walks through using Merrill's principles um, and using the R2-D2 model. I use this. I would teach this with, um, with designers and companies because they didn't 
they had the title, but they didn't really understand the role. So those are the kinds of things that you that I would do with with uh, folks in business. I love that you have. <laughs> I know I have it right here on my desk. It's laminated. <laughs> it's laminated, and we would we weren't going to talk about that, but that just has to show you what, what kind of a design um, I am. That, that is the perfect visual for me saying Mick blending the old school with the new school. Yeah. <laughs> you have a laminated <laughs> principles on your desk. There you go, people. <laughs> For anyone who wants to say, she's so far out there with this. <laughs> no, no, no. R2D2 model and first principles laminated sitting on my desk. <laughs> yep. That's true. Yep. <laughs> um, well, I don't want to keep you, but we, I don't okay. know, Jason, how are we doing? We're trying to uh, track down Drew, I think, right? I don't know. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm going to send him some emails here. To okay. Just see well, I just want to thank everybody for, for being a part of it. And if you all, if any of you are interested in any of my work or have any questions or you want to talk with me, my, uh, Jennifer, do you have my email address somewhere? Do you mind if we post it? Um, no, here? please. Okay. Post yeah, I've got it. a handy right here. Let me yeah. grab it. Post my email and I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm very um, passionate about design. I believe that, that the only way to continue to evolve as a designer is through things like this and through practice and through failure and through talking to other designers and keeping an open mind and knowing who you are um, and knowing that you will continue to evolve. And so with that, um, go out there and make an impact. Whoa. Take it home, Monica. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now can you see why she's on our board yes <laughs> okay so with that am i hanging up now yeah you you're off the hook now okay bye-bye everybody Monica. thank you bye-bye <laughs>